The views expressed on this show by guests and the host on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of 9-11 Freefall. I'm the host Andy Steele and just as we promised, we are bringing Michael Parker onto the show because we had our event and if you haven't watched it, it's out there on YouTube. It's close to 5,000 views at this moment and that's pretty good considering that they're trying to censor us and throttle our view count on that platform. But if you haven't watched it, uh, go ahead and do so, but we we're going to have Michael scheduled for that event. And uh, unfortunately, there were some kind of gremlins that happened. We have no audio uh, for him uh, during that. So we said, you know what? We're not going to let the system win. We're going to bring him onto the show for a full hour. And you're going to notice that I got a new set up here. We did this for the anniversary event, but I like it. I'm going to keep it up. I'm just noticing right now I've got two AE logos on either side of me, a little repetitive. So we may uh, introduce some variety in the coming weeks, but keep your eyes out uh, for that. Let's go ahead and introduce our guest. Uh, Michael Parker is a media host, producer, and musician. He has hosted or produced over a thousand episodes of standalone content, including his popular internet television program, Antidote. He has appeared as himself on the Travel Channel uh, in documentaries and frequently as a guest on terrestrial and internet radio. Uh, he also co-wrote the title songs for our film Seven and The Unspeakable with hip-hop artist Remo Conscious and contributed two songs to the soundtrack of Loose Change Final Cut by Dylan Avery. His current podcast is Michael Parker Media and can be found on all major platforms. Let's go ahead and bring him on in. Michael, welcome to 9-11 Freefall. Andy, thank you so much for having me on. And I just wanted to say... I. The other night when we were doing the show, I watched the whole thing backstage. Everything seemed to be hunky-dory. I had issues. I don't know what it was, but I do want to say to anybody who hasn't watched it yet, the conversation, even though I couldn't take part, was fantastic. And I really appreciated the invite, and I'm glad to be here with you today. Well, we're happy to have you, and, and thanks to Jeff Long for making this connection happen. And let me just uh, turn my ringer off there. Um, and, you know, those kind of things only happen usually around the anniversary time. We come under, a, there's people who try to hack the website uh, around the anniversary, and it's, it's something new every year. It's like a different present that the system gives us that we can look forward to opening up. But whatever, that's the great thing about having my own show is that I can bring on anybody that I want to anytime I want to. Uh, so, Michael, tell our audience about your program. Uh, if they're not familiar with it, talk about uh, some of the stuff that you cover on this show. Well, um, right now, the new podcast is called Michael Parker Media, and I think I'm at episode 14 of that right now. And it's a continuation of the work that I've been doing since 2006. I actually kind of accidentally fell into internet radio podcasting world. I worked in the music business for many years, and then in around 99, 2000, I was working for I was working for Virgin Entertainment. I created a streaming audio radio station for them at the time, which was way ahead of the curve, which was called Radio Free Virgin, and we ended up having 50 channels of streaming audio and such. And then um, I went to work. Oh, <laughs> check this out. So as we when we were doing that. That was 2000 into 2001. I was the uh, the programming manager for that. And uh, it just so happens that 9-11 happened. And so when 9-11 happened, a month later, me and my team all ended up getting laid off. And that was another casualty amongst all of the casualties that happened with 9-11. Same thing happened with COVID. All of a sudden, companies took the opportunity to lay people off. You know, they would say, well, because of 9-11, because of COVID, you know, we're experiencing less revenue, less growth, what have you. Anyway, so that broke my heart. I was without a job for a year. Another interesting thing about 9-11 at that time for my family 
like everyone else, I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. My wife and I had just found out two days prior that we were pregnant with our first child. So mm -hmm. um, that moment in time for me was huge and a, an extremely emotional and difficult time for me, just like it was for everyone else. And for a year, you know, I, I struggled um, trying to find new work. I eventually went to work for um, the estate of Frank Zappa, um, working for Gail Zappa, who was his widow. And um, at that point, you know, I was still not really doing podcasting. I had just come off this thing of creating this internet radio station. And I remember working for the Zappas when um, when the shock and awe thing happened and we were all in the office. And some people in the office at the time thought, oh, it's great. You know, we're going to get back at the bad guys and everything. And I thought the whole thing was awful because I was a truther day one. And I, if I could expand on that, when I say that I was a truther day one, it was because I was already in the late 90s, I began to read the work of people like Jim Mars, who was a, a hero to me. I was very skeptical of um, a lot of things, and I was researching these things. So on the morning when 9-11 happened, my wife, who's Australian, wakes me up from the other room. She's turned on the TV and watched this. And I watched it, and um, I'm not a genius, but I trust my eyes. And I, to me, from day one, I was like, well, wait a minute, this, this looks like every controlled demolition that I've ever seen um, on television. You, you'd see the ones in Las Vegas or whatever. And then later in the day when they said they had found the passport of one of the hijackers, I was like, well, that's just, that's impossible. Because if this thing happened the way you're telling me it happened, you're telling me that a small book of paper existed beyond this collision. So from day one, I did not believe it. I go back to work a couple of days later and I tell some of my close friends at work, I'm like, look, I, I don't believe this thing happened. And that was my first taste of just the sheer disdain and, and disbelief that people would have if you dared to question the official story. And as I said, you know, 30 days later, we were all laid off anyway. And that led into a year of me trying to figure out what I'm going to do. My wife is pregnant. I've got to find a new job. We're in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. It was, it was a horrible experience. So then I'm now I'm working for the Zappas running their office in Studio City. Um, the shock and awe Iraq invasion happens and I'm watching it. Anyway, 9-11 consumed me, my imagination and my sense of expression on a very deep level, almost from the beginning. So while I was at the Zappas, I started making a record. I was using some of their musicians and people that I knew. And that record turned out to be a record called Phantasmagoria. And that record was basically a concept album based upon my impression of post 9-11 America. It was kind of the American dream turns American nightmare. Flash for several songs on that album were directly reflecting 9-11. And then in 2006, I went to this thing in downtown LA called the 9-11, the neocon agenda, which I believe Alex Jones put on, if I remember correctly, but I go down there because I had this record in hand and um, this is it. I know the audience can't see it, but it's an American flag that's made out of bullets and guns. And um, I went down to that, to that event, hoping to meet Dylan Avery and um, Jason Burmas because I admired their work and I wanted to introduce myself to them, um, which I did. I, I met them in the halls and it was interesting because we became fast friends after that. I also met other people in the movement at the time. I met Alex for a second. He was dubious of me, but I don't blame him because when you meet strangers at these types of events, you don't know who's legit or who's trying to make trouble. So he kind of pushed me away at the time, but I bet I get it. I no, no anger. Um, but I also met people like Jim Fester and just all these people who were in the movement from the get go for better or worse. And, um, Anyway, I stayed in touch with Dylan. I stayed in touch with Jason and Corey and those guys. And I ended up, because they would come stay at my house when they were in LA. And uh, my very first podcast show at the time was called Dark Matter. This was prior to um, Art Bell going back on the air and calling his show Dark Matter. But um, that, again, was just a coincidence. It was a good name. So uh, there's a lot of things that have come since my show that have all been called Dark Matter. But Dark Matter was my first 
podcasting internet radio show. We did 200 of those. That started in spring of 2006. Of those shows, I devoted a lot to 9-11 Truth. So I was in the movement from the get-go. Uh, my stance has not changed. I still feel the same ways about it now that I did then. I've since covered a lot of other subjects, um, not 9-11 as much as I did at the time. But at one point, yes, I was very deep into it, and it consumed a great deal of my bandwidth as it has many of the people in the movement because we were just looking for the truth. We knew that we were being lied to and we wanted, what can I do? How can I help? What stories can I tell? And uh, for me, I could make some art and have an internet radio show. That is the spirit that drove a lot of people, including myself. I kind of thought of it like superheroes. Like we all come up with our own approach and everything, but we come together when it's right to do this important cause. And don't let anyone out there tell you, I'm saying this to the audience, don't let anyone out there say that you got to fall in line behind any certain group or follow any uh, certain people. You can do your own thing and have a huge impact. And uh, I got involved with AE and, uh, you know, here we are in 2023 still beating the drum on this issue and you know even though we haven't gotten a new investigation even though the system has gotten into the bunker and surrounded it with barbed wire and put a bunch of landmines around it the fact that they have to act in this particular way the fact that their phoniness and their obfuscation is so obvious <clears throat> shows that we have won to a large extent at least in the court of public opinion because when I first started this, and you probably felt this uh, or had this experience yourself, when you go out and talk to people, there were some very hostile reactions to this information. Uh, but now, generally, people say, yeah, I never really trusted that story. Now, there's a general apathy as well that we have to overcome and remind people why this is still important. But at least people are at this stage. And it's because of so many individuals doing small things well every single day. Uh, that helps us win this war. And, you know, I, I hope nobody started this uh, this work and got in this movement thinking it was all going to be wrapped up in a short time because that's not how movements work. So thank God for all the independent minds and artists and uh, people out there bringing whatever talents they have to the table because we need it all in this important fight. Now, you're involved in the entertainment industry. I'm kind of curious about your opinion on uh, this from, from that perspective. Yes. I noticed that after September 11th, there was uh, <clears throat> there was like a hush that went over entertainment. For instance, and Bill Maher has been very hostile to 9-11 Truth. So I'm yes. not going to claim that he's some 9-11 Truther. But, you know, he said something that was expressing an opinion. I'm not going to, you know, judge what his, his opinion or whatever. But I, I respect somebody who says what they're thinking. And there was a lot of people saying, oh, the terrorists are cowards after 9-11. And he just made a, a slight comment saying, well, you know, I mean, it took a, you know, I mean, they ran planes into the buildings. We're the ones firing missiles at people from across the ocean. My God, there was a freak out. He got his whole show canceled over this. And I thought that was a little bit overboard. It's unfortunate that he became so hostile to the cause that I care about later. But you saw this continue on. Dixie Chicks questioning whether we should go into Iraq. There was a big backlash against them. Uh, I want to get your commentary on this, this, cultural censorship over entertainment immediately after 9-11? And do you think that it's lifted to any extent by now? On the subject of 9-11, um, I think it's lifted a hair. Um, but what I've noticed, and I, I'm going to be completely honest with your with your audience, because all they have to do is look for me on social media and they can tell where I'm coming from on various things. I grew up in West Texas. I grew up in a Republican family. Um, I still have what I would consider like traditional values. I'm a super open-minded guy. I played in bands. I like to have, I'm not a prude. I like to have a good time and I've certainly had my wild nights out. Um, but culturally, I'm just coming from kind of a regular guy point of view. And when 9-11 happened, I was not really on the right at that point in my life. And I think most people would probably have thought I was coming from the left. And I commiserated with people like the Dixie Chicks. Um, I didn't think that we should have gone in there and did not done that either. I did not think that they should have been crucified for speaking their mind. Now, over time, what I've noticed is that, you know, uh, when I said I wasn't exactly on the right, I, I have voted from people of all 
stripes. I voted for Republicans. I voted for Democrats. I voted Green. I voted Independent. I've I've voted for the people that I thought I liked or, and or, that I could relate to and I believed. And my meaning is that I can disagree with you on policy if I think you are of good character. And but over time, and I remember in the in the days after 9-11, um, it was Air America. So Air America was kind of the left's response to Fox News and things that was on the radio. So I would listen to that a lot. And you know, I was listening to NPR a lot. Um, and my first show, Dark Matter, of which we did several. I think a couple hundred episodes, people might have thought I was coming from the left because I was a 9-11 truther and I commiserated with these people. But the main thing was I was an anti-war guy. At heart, I'm more of a Ron Paul kind of guy. But over time, all of this to say is that, and I've this has upset some people when I've said it in the past, but I'm just going to be totally frank, is that the left in the 1960s was very much pro-freedom of speech and anti-establishment and always kind of represented itself that way. And certainly in the post 9-11 atmosphere, um, to me, the Bushites and the right seemed to be just completely off the rails, man. It was like, you know, you're with us or you're against us. So you couldn't immediately we clamped down on free speech and there was this embrace of authoritarianism by the right. And weirdly enough, now I see the left being exactly the same about that on another subject. So, you know, you were talking about the Dixie Chicks and Bill Maher on 9-11. Well, when COVID came around, it was the same thing. If you spoke out against the vaccine or something like that, all of a sudden you are the worst person in the world and you're shut down. So I think it still exists. I think 9-11 now they're actually trying to normalize the acceptance of 9-11. And I think that's part of the reason that Biden didn't do anything in New York yesterday. I think that's why he was in um, Alaska. But if you look in art, there are certain people that have made things that nod to a knowledge of 9-11. And um, when I was making these notes that I was going to bring up on the show the other night, one of the things that always stuck out in my mind, it was one of the Iron Man movies. I think it's Iron Man 3. And um, Ben Kingsley plays this fake terrorist. Yep. I was like, there you go. So, I mean, people in art and in Hollywood um, have made things that let you know that they know. But they will not say that in public. They will act like this is all fiction and the work of... um, people taking ideas from conspiracy forms or what have you. But people know... um, so now in Hollywood, I think it's worse even than it was after 9-11, just not necessarily on the subject of 9-11. Um, it's on other subjects. You just can't talk about this. You can't talk about that. I mean, I think, and I've said this on my shows many times, the 21st century has been absolutely terrible for the United States. And the shadow of the aftermath of the things that happened on 9-11 um, the repercussions of that resonate through all areas of culture. And the worst aspect of it has been the embrace of authoritarianism and the clampdown on free speech. Just before I came on here, I saw something and I haven't had a chance to look into it deeply. The guy that works with uh, um, Alex Jones, I can't think of the kid's name, young man. Um, he just got 60 beard? days. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm looking yeah, for it here. It Supposedly he, he just got 60 days in jail. If and I've got to look, I've got to read more into this for just speaking out about J6. So what I'm telling you is I am not optimistic for the United States at this point. I do think that we will have 9-11 truth. It already exists. It already exists. There's people that know. You know, I know a lot of people know they just won't say so. But on a larger macro thing. Freedom of speech is being crimped in a very big way. That concerns me a lot. And Hollywood, Hollywood is made up of a lot of people who will suck up in a heartbeat and just go along with whatever. Right now, okay, right now, the situation with Trump, Trump is like the scapegoat for everything that's gone wrong. Now, whatever happens in the next election, I don't know what it is. But one thing about 9-11 truth, and this is my personal theory, could be wrong. But once Trump is out of the picture, I think that the left and people 
that have used him as the thing to avoid all other questions about everything else will then have to do some deep searching because they will not be able to blame everything in the world on Donald Trump. And they will then have to re-examine all of these other things that have happened. And he is just the, uh, the voodoo doll, the scapegoat that we're using to avoid this deep introspection that we as a country have to do to accept what has happened, not only with 9-11, but with the elections, with COVID, all of these various things that have our loss of free speech, um, the sheer disintegration of our national unity through socially engineered division, this creation of dividing everybody into these tiny groups by sex, race, religion, uh, et cetera. I mean, this has been a very sophisticated thing. And, uh, 9-11 was the thing that kicked it off, and we still feel the effects of it, and it, it makes me really upset when I think about it. Well, me too, and I just wanted to say something quick about Iron Man 3, because this is actually a key thing I've never brought up. So if anybody watches that, the whole premise of it is that the villain ends up being a fake terrorist that I think yeah. the vice president is trying to take control of the government. And so they're putting out, he's putting out these messages of terrorism against, you know, and he's, they're, they're doing acts of terrorism, but it's false flags because it's really just an actor. Well, in the comic books, the villain, the Mandarin, is actually like, he's not a fake terrorist or anything he's an actual villain so they added this element to the movie and completely remade the character to put out that message and that is incredibly interesting with the way that parallels with the whole yes. uh, bin laden narrative so they they, yes. they uh made a conscious decision to do that so I, I recommend people even if you're not into that kind of stuff watch that movie just to uh take in that factor um, but no, what you're saying is absolutely correct. I mean, look, I can remember I've been around in the movement <clears throat> in one place or another since about 2006. And I can remember that when you would go out and talk about these issues with people, I mean, the first person outside of family that I talked about 9-11 with said, oh, you sound like one of those conspiracy theorists. You're scaring me. Like, yep. this scares you, really, that I'm just talking about this? But yeah. also, if you talk, you know, you, when you wake up to 9-11, you expand out to other things. What upset me uh, deeply was the drone strikes against people in Pakistan. You know, somebody who uh, happens to maybe have a cousin that drove for bin Laden at one point goes to a wedding. They say, hey, let, he's, he's there with 100 other people. Let's fire a, a missile in the middle of this wedding. And, you know, kill a few kids and the bride and everything. And, you know, you don't think you're going to create more terrorists out of that. Um, but that, that upset me deeply. But you would talk to people about this and they thought it was more amusing that I'm like upset about this than than taking in any of the information that I'm uh, that I'm you know, bringing to them. And they kind of look at you like a funny picture on the wall. So we went from a society giggling at their cell phones to Trump comes into office. Now, suddenly it's in vogue to be political. Right. And. You know, everybody's on one side or the other, and they think that, you know, following NBC News or Fox News, let's be fair, both sides, you know, they yes. think by following these particular things that they're somehow informed. This makes them, you know, at, at the cutting edge and that they're somehow, you know, they're, they're like us now. And then what's funny is that people like, like us and the people on the Internet who were talking about 9-11 and about these issues when it wasn't cool suddenly became cool and get uh, get drowned out by all these phonies that are just you know worrying about likes and all this other stuff. So seeing this huge shift and how quickly it happened, and it divided our movement too from people getting lost in all the politics. Do you think that TV is too big of an influence in our society? That media and TV, because it's all coming from the television. They can mm -hmm. put rock and roll music to any agenda. You know, put yep. Kid Rock. Music to uh, to the bombs exploding in Iraq, and man, I want to go join the army. Not me, but people watching it. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, is it too big of an influence, and do people need to shut it off, or do we need to focus on changing it? Well, that's a good question, and and it's a really big question um, mm -hmm. because it's not just television. Um, the reach media, and I I'm a guy who's in the media has been the fourth estate. You know, th th this has been the partner in crime to the military industrial complex. They have portrayed this, uh, these narratives that we've been speaking about for 
30 minutes, not just on television, but on radio, on um, the internet. And they're loud. And we've got We've got essentially digital bullying at this point. So the media, I, I, I don't even hardly watch television anymore. I'm, I'm from Texas. I like football. So I watch football occasionally. My wife and I watch a movie. Um, but I do not watch the news on television. I have trusted sources on the Internet that I, I pull my information from. But I do not watch television hardly at all, basically for what you're describing. But it, but it is beyond television. These same messages are being sent in the last vestiges of print media, on radio, on the Internet. Um, so it's beyond television. But yes, the media has become the drug that, or, and the club. We're either going to drug you or we're going to club you. But one way or another... You're going to come to our side because we're going to beat it into you. And so that leaves people like you and I who've been speaking out about these things almost from the get go. And not just about this, but other subjects as well. Um, sometimes we seem like the lone wolf in the forest. But I think that there is a knowledge amongst a vast array and a larger number than the media or the government would ever want you to know of people who if they don't know for sure, they strongly suspect that what the things that you and I are talking about are in fact true. But you know what? For self-preservation and financial preservation, they feel like I have to keep this information to myself, which is awful that this has happened because one of the great things about America was that we were all supposed to be able to have these conversations in a civilized manner. And I don't have to agree with you, but you have the right to say these things. And we had the right to question what our government or our uh, leaders did. And now, no, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus. And trust me, Jack, you don't want to be off the bus because if you're off the bus, you're going to be out of money. So, I mean, they have really beaten us to death with all this stuff. I don't know how much longer it will work. Um, I will also, because I'm on a rant here, but I will say it has always been the case that small portions of people are the ones who can actually eventually make the difference. So it, there are some people that are never going to accept what you and I accepted a long time ago. And when I say accept it, I just mean that I don't accept it. It repulses me, but I know that this is most likely what happened. I've understood that some people will never be able to even take that on because to do so would fracture everything that they know and believe in because they just they just don't want to know. So there's going to be that portion of the population that's never going to be on board with this. But that's okay. That's the way it is. And the good news is, is that in the end, small portions of the, of, of the population can ultimately make the difference. Yeah, you know, growing up, you know, you would see dystopian movies and stuff, and it puts this impression in your mind that if fascism ever came to America, it would be a a, a jackboot, you know, stepping on the face of, of humanity, and that censorship would be done in such a way that it's like, you are not allowed to speak this, or you'll be thrown into a camp or something. So we grew up with these ideas, but what we see now is instead of this kind of jackboot way. I mean, there is a jackboot element with what's going on with the censorship online and that censorship that happens in the media, but it's also this manipulation, this you hurt my feelings by being real mentality. And, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about how it happens in the truth movement with certain things, but it happens in the general world too, that if somebody is real, somebody expresses what they're really thinking, you are hurting somebody's feelings and that person's feelings are more important than your right to free speech. And I think the only way to fight that is to unapologetically repeat it. Don't worry about it. Don't be manipulated. Don't, don't fall for the, the fake tears, the crocodile tears of your manipulators just walk right past it because that's the only way that uh, that you can beat this, in my opinion, not succumbing to it. Now, I remember when I was a kid, and I brought this up to Dylan Avery during the event, but I want to get your thoughts on this. When I was a kid, one of the big movies was JFK by Oliver Stone. And mm -hmm. it was like 1991. <clears throat> and what was interesting about it is that I can remember the big uh, uh, marketing rollout for it. Now, typically, if there was something that's, you know, pushing the envelope on a controversial issue, they the, there won't be a big marketing rollout. You'll barely hear about it. You'll be lucky if you find some streaming version of it 
uh, somewhere on some obscure website. <clears throat> That's today. But back then, it was talked about on like Entertainment Tonight yeah. and these kinds of things, E! Online, and it got its time in the sun. Uh, and it had some big name actors and was considered one of the movies of the year. Uh, do you think that that can ever happen again, or can that happen in today's environment with something that's controversial, 9-11 or otherwise? Again, that is a great question, and I hadn't actually thought of that. When I was doing Antidote for the Lip TV in Beverly Hills, Sean Stone, Oliver's son, also had a show on there that some of your listeners may remember because he was a 9-11 truther as well, called Buzzsaw. And we were never in the studio very often at the same time, but back to JFK, that is a really interesting I don't remember. Was that 89, 88, 1990? It was 91. 91. I had this okay. corrected because I couldn't come up with a year during the event. So your point is, is excellent because you're right. I don't know if something because, OK, people talk about JFK assassination and 9-11 often in the same breath. Um, and I actually think that makes a lot of sense because these are watershed tragic moments of the American experience in which all of us were witness to these horrid, horrific, traumatizing events. Now, JFK, the film, you're right. It had lots of accolades. It was a big deal. It was one of the movies of the year and it addresses or presages almost many of the questions that we've now had to deal with again in the 9-11 truth movement. So Honestly, I don't know if that can happen again because the investors in the, the film companies that make these movies are also the investors in the pharmaceutical industry. Listen, I came from the energy industry. Um, there's there's so I'm. The investors in these things are all parts of the system, and I think right now. The system does not want to talk about any of these questions that would call all of these other things into question. And they are, in fact, all related to each other, even if people don't see it immediately. So I don't know if that kind of film will happen again on an indie on an indie level. Yes. On a major um, big movie. I don't know. Well, what's interesting, too, is that back in the past, and I used to listen to talk radio when I was a kid. I was probably the only kid in my class listening to, to uh, oh, uh, Jim Bohannon, I remember, was the yes. name on the radio. Um, and so whenever they would have an advertiser, you know, obviously you have to make money when you have a radio show and, and you have advertisers and stuff. And so there would be a segment where they talk about how wonderful a certain product is. And then they go on with their programming, which is really uninfluenced by with the, the program. Um, and the news, you know, would have commercials and things like this. But what we started to notice, too, is that there were uh, advertisements being put in the news. Like they would do certain news stories about a particular topic. And people wouldn't know that this news story is just being done to push the product. Like, for instance, there was this whole thing. And I remember hearing about this because this uh, influenced a member of my family where they claimed that there was a pharmacy or pharmacist shortage in America. And, oh, you're going to make a ton of money if you go to pharmacy school and become a pharmacist. And then, uh, it, but it comes out later that this was just a marketing ploy, that they had cooperated with the, the news and and put this information out there because it was uh, marketing by the uh, pharmacy colleges. So, you know, that's just one small thing with no major consequence, but now apply this to the pharmaceuticals you know, uh, and I'm not the type of person who thinks that every time there's a shooting that it's going to be some inside job. But how many of these people are are whacked out on all of these um, SSRI inhibitors that they're put on? We should be having a major study of this. Uh, Absolutely. But you're not going to hear about that on CNN and all these other places because I, I believe CNN has a big uh, pharmacy or pharmaceutical con uh, company uh, contract, you know, as, as their backers there. Um, if not CNN, then other companies as well, because they're, they're a major sponsor of the news. So this is what influences things. The problem is the average person doesn't think about this stuff. They just think they turn on that TV and it's just some guy like you're watching this program that's just telling you about the news and what they think. What do you have to say about all that? Well, <laughs> product placement in the news, that's an interesting idea. And um, I don't know that I've thought about it too much other than Yes, I've talked about this on my show many times. It's think about all the drug commercials that come on in every television show, whether it's the news or your sports or whatever it is. And then of that 60 seconds of that commercial, 
30 to 40 seconds of it is all the list of side effects. Yet, <laughs> it's still on your television. The person's out there walking around in a field of wheat looking happy and blissful um, because of the SSRI or, or, or whatever it is that they're purchasing. So, yes, I mean, they definitely have a stranglehold on, on content management. But back to the people watching television, and I'm not picking on people because I part of me has had to ultimately make a little bit of peace with this. When I was first starting in the truth movement and I was starting doing my own podcast and I was figure outing, figuring out all of this information, I was like, surely everybody wants to know this, right? So I was kind of the obnoxious guy telling everybody and sending emails to people and articles. And, and what I found was like, whoa, some people do not like this at all. And it makes you very unpopular very quickly. So, you know, I learned, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to dial this down. And, and so I learned that I'm not going to try to preach to everyone. I'm going to try to save the message for those who are open to hearing it. And so when, when there's people that are watching television, some of them, the minute that the advertisement comes on, their mind goes into another place. And that's kind of what happens when they are faced with uncomfortable truths that make them ponder larger questions. Like, so, well, I don't want to watch the commercial, so I'm now thinking about these other things. Well, when Michael brings up 9-11 or COVID or whatever it is, well, I'm going to pretend that I'm listening to him or I'm just going to ask him to stop or I'm going to get pissed off or whatever it is. But so my point is, is that I've kind of, gone inward. I still do my shows. I'm not on social media out there telling everybody. I'm not on Facebook hardly at all. I am on Twitter because Twitter is really just Twitter slash X, whatever it is now, is a place in which we can all say what's on our mind. But on Facebook, which is mostly my family and friends, I'm hardly out there. But initially, I was that guy cheerleading and trying to spread the news. But I found that the old, the old saying, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So sometimes you can push people away by trying to tell them the truth and they're just not going to accept it. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't try. I'm just saying that there's some people who are never going to get it. And those are the same people that can watch television all day and never question all of those side effects of the drugs and why is a particular channel or all channels just pushing their own agenda of the way that they see the world and you should get on board with that. Right. And it would make, that make sense, sense if it came. Yeah. And it, you know, here's the thing for me, just having my finger to the pulse and I don't claim to, you know, have it to the pulse of all of America, but just from the average middle class perspective here, the average American that they portray on the television is not the real American that you see when you go to the supermarket and Walmart uh, it's, you know, most people are just trying to get through their lives and go to their work, raise a kid and pay the bills. Yep. And at the end of the day, just want to put on some entertainment and, and, uh, fall asleep to it. Um, so it seems like most people out there are sick of the polarized news. You know, you turn to MSNBC, if you're cheering for the left team and Fox, right. if you're cheering for the right team. And that something that is just goes back to traditional news would do very well uh, out there and more people would watch it. That's just unbiased and presents the facts. Uh, but it seems like the networks refuse to go back to this model. And we got and it started after September 11th, um, in my view. I mean, maybe a little Agreed. before it with Fox News. Um because, yeah, the news was incredibly biased against anybody that spoke out about uh, the issues we're talking about and other things. Um, <clears throat> and I know that's one of the most disturbing things for me in the aftermath of September 11th. Maybe that element was always there within America, but it brought it out more. And, and, it, yeah. and it just like how, I don't know, it's just like they became pod people or something. And no, I don't mean that literally, but I'm just talking about figuratively. Um and the thing is, I'm not judging people out there either, because everybody has cognitive dissonance, yes. uh, even people in the truth movement on certain sure. uh, issues and things like that. Um, but what what to you is the most disturbing aspect of the post 9-11 world in which you've seen develop? 
what you just described. This is the thing that scares me to death is just this, this polarization that was caused, I believe, intentionally. So they are definitely trying to break us all up into small groups because if we all realized that we were on the same team, which is the human team, which is the American team, we don't care about your sex. We don't care about your race. We don't care about your gender identity. You're a human. I'm a human. We happen to be Americans. If we had that, then we could overcome a lot of this. But the whole point, and I've, I've tried to explain the idea of social engineering to people in the past, but yes, when 9-11 happened, the things that we don't like in the media seem to be ramped up Um in a big way. So now it's very agenda driven. Now the aspects of free speech are less valued and it's just messaging. So here's the message. We're all, I mean, you've seen the videos that happen where ladies and gentlemen, there, there are scripts that are sent to um, news used to be the newswire back in the day, I think is what they called it. So if you worked for a newspaper, you would get this thing over the wire, which was a paragraph or two explaining a particular story that happened somewhere else. And then you would read that on the news. Well, now it's the same thing. It's just, you know, they're getting it via email or whatever, but there's look it up on, on YouTube or your video platform of choice. People will have edited this where people will say the same bullet points verbatim. And then there'll be hundreds of these. I mean, this is messaging. Don't don't mistake what this is. This is straight up bald face messaging. And it is to get you to go along with whatever it is that they're putting in place. So the thing that bothers me the most is the constraints on free speech and the embrace of authoritarianism. Right. And uh, and right. this is just getting heavier and heavier and it's going to continue yeah. to go until people walk away. Now, part of the issue and I'll get your commentary on the censorship here, because part of the issue is there was an alternative. I really believe that the bad guys, whoever brought down the towers on September 11th, did not count on there being a group of people this dedicated to looking at these buildings and analyzing uh, right down to the, to the nucleus of this issue, uh, why the official story is incorrect and keeping at it for so long. And so once they, you know, they may have tried to ignore it at first, but then it became a problem for them. And then they started clamping down on the internet. Now it would be okay if there was some kind of alternative to the internet for everybody to migrate to. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't. And when I say the internet, I'm you know I talk about uh, meaning Google because everybody uses a Google search and and then other stuff like Yahoo and those are actually the only two off the top of my head. Um, and DuckDuckGo, but that uses Google too. They're, they're really just as censored and people don't know about alternative platforms. So it's like all of our roads of information are being cut off. What do we do to reinvigorate the momentum that we were seeing in alternative media, like around 2008 up till about uh, 2014? How, what do we do to reinvigorate that given these challenges? Well, that's a good question. Last year, I was working for a network. I did 600 interviews for them in less than a year. And then in January, they told me, we're taking your show off the air, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not even going to say the name of the network because it, it bummed me out so bad. But the good side of it was that that whole network, which still exists, was brought about in another country as a reaction to the COVID mandates in that country. So this was... A, my point is, is that there are still people that react to things and will put their money where their mouth is. And some of those things will be more successful than others, but I don't think it's ever going to go away. And every time something truly horrific or appalling happens, like a 9-11 or, um, or COVID and all these things, people are going to push back. How successful they will be is going to be to varying degrees. And some people will make a name for themselves on, in those things. Some, some businesses will be launched that, that flourish, some don't. But I think that they can't control the internet to the extent that they can clamp down on all speech. They can make it difficult for us, like me trying to get on your show the other day, but it's just too big. And I think, I think they're okay with a certain degree of pushback. And your point is well taken about the um, the people behind 9-11. Yeah, I don't think initially they thought that there would be this much of a sus sus 
sustained pushback against it. And that's why I said earlier in the show, I think there's now an effort to normalize this acceptance of 9-11. Oh, you know, that happened a long time ago. It was this novel event that nobody could have seen coming. And guess what? At the end, we got the bad guy. And um, that, and I think that's part of the reason that Biden was in Alaska. They, they want to diminish our memory of these things and the questions that arise around them by just acting like that was a long time ago. We've moved on. And I, I was watching football last night. And they were talking about the 9-11 memorials were now going to be national days of service. Listen, I think service is a great thing. And I think that we need more of it back into our communities. But it felt a little bit like, wait a minute. So I thought this was more of a memoriam than an opportunity for service. It can be both. But it just seems to me like they are subtly trying to change our understanding and appreciation of what I call the signature event of the 21st century. And they want to do that. Listen, still, if you're a 9-11 truther, they're, they're still after you. Don't, don't think they're not. Um, but I think they're also trying to change the public at large's view of the event so that you'll kind of gradually over time feel less and less about it. Right. And, and that's going to happen as people get older and new generations yeah. come in. I mean, I'm not going to think about Pearl Harbor the same way that somebody right. who lived during it is going to. You know what scares me, though, is that like with not just with 9-11 truth, because there's a lot of people that agree with me, but they'll sort of joke about it. Um, and you can even hear this getting worked into, you know, comedy and on television and stuff. And also, um, just with other things, the censorship or whatever, uh, you know, we just had a, a, a press release censored trying to send that out and it's I almost saw that. like, okay. Yeah. And like, you know, in the past, it used to be that you'd get the press release out at least, and then the media would ignore it, but it's like, oh, you're going to cut us off now. Okay. And there's almost like you start to chuckle at, at first, but I'm like, wait a second, you don't want to normalize this. Like when I was uh, in the Peace Corps uh, in a dictatorship in Uzbekistan, people would laugh at the tyranny. You know, if something uh, you can't you can't send a videotape out of uh, something, you know, somebody doing you doing a present for your friend's wedding because they don't want the videotapes going out. So you can't see the poverty. And it's like you get frustrated and someone make a joke. Oh, give them a few dollars. <laughs> and it's when you start joking about the tyranny that if there's an acceptance happening. And I never wanted to see America get to that point. We used to be outraged whenever our boundaries are pushed. But now it's like, oh, wow, you know, I can't uh, that website's down and. I can't uh, find this video anymore. Ha 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 ha. Everything's falling apart. You don't want to get to that point. So I have to even check that within myself. Do you think it personally that this issue can ever get too old in our lifetimes? Obviously, you know, 150 years from now, that's, that's one thing. But while we're still on this planet, can this really get too old for people to care about? Do you think that this, this, uh, dulling of its impact by the media can really work? Well, I think that the bad guys want it to go away in exactly the sense that you're talking about what I'm saying about this idea of normalizing it. But back to Dylan Avery for a second, because so Dylan used to stay at my house a lot and uh, my kids were very small and my daughters are now both in college. And I used to kid around to my daughters. I was like, hey, girls, remember the guy in sandals? It was always at my house. <laughs> Well, that's Dylan Avery. And in the future, people are going to look at him as one of the, a man who made an immeasurable, significant uh, impact on the United States. Because in the future, we will look back at this and we will know what happened. And we will look back at 9-11 truth, I believe, as the true American spirit. It won't be some of these other things that come about, you know, but but the people, the 9-11 truth movement, the anti-mandate people, that is the true American spirit, the spirit that says, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, we're not, we're not playing that. That that that's not the way this country works. And I deserve to be able to speak about this. And Dylan's movie, along with Jason and Corey, I do believe. In the future, we will recognize the impact of that film, the truth of 9-11. And I think it's going to take a while, but I think inevitably in the future, we will know this 
And in the meantime, they're going to try. They will keep trying to minimize us. They will keep trying to demonize us. They will keep trying to push back against those who want the truth. But it will never die. No. And I mean, I will carry it as far as I can, even if I'm going to hover around someday, you know, pushing the little the little horn with the 9-11 was an inside job bumper sticker on the back of it. Uh, I will keep on doing whatever I can in whatever capacity, even if I'm never not at AE anymore, I'll do what I can and, and speak out. Um, <clears throat> but you can see how things are being drowned out by, you know, people playing video games on podcasts yep. and, and they're paying for views. And there's a lot of people who think that what we do, like they've seized on what we do, we became cool, but they're using this just sort of as a cliche stepping stone to an acting career or something like that. Yep. And, you know, and so in doing that, you've got to put it, push out official narratives or talk about things that are just complete tripe. Now, I said during the event, I would love for all of this to disappear because we got 9-11 justice and all of the attention now swings to C-SPAN because that's when all the hearings are happening and uh, and the indictments and all of that. Um, there may be I, there may be a young person, and that's where we got to focus, is on the next generation of people to carry this forward and be ready for the next big lie that gets shoved down our throats to speak yep. out about it and cite 9-11 and JFK and all of these other things. Um, but there may be somebody who wants to break in into maybe radio or into some other kind of form of the arts, uh, but they're under pressure to conform. Now, we're leaving a public record for the future. Anybody wants to be inspired, look back to this program. What do you have to say to those future people when they're faced with that uh, choice of whether to sell out or to follow their own principles and speak out about the topics that they believe in? You have to be true to yourself. You have to you have to do the right thing, I believe. Now, I'm not everybody. There's going to be some people that just don't care. There will be some people who care for a minute, but then they're offered that why in the road, right? You can do this or you can do this. But for me and for you and for others like us, the truth is always what will matter because we can't shake that. We cannot... I have children. I'm not sure if you have children, but I was telling them a member of my family one time. I'm like, bro, if you want to reap the rewards of the system, you have to also be invested in the continuance of the system. And by the system, I mean the American experiment, the Republic, the Constitution, all of those things that this thing is built upon. You can't just Say, well, you know what, I'm going to turn off the news and not pay attention, and I don't care, and I don't like this guy or that guy because of this, that, or the other thing. No, you have to be invested entirely because you have children like I have children, and if you want to pass this thing on to them, well, then you're going to have to get involved. Not everyone will, but I have to believe that there are people out there who will come upon this, and they will see injustice, and it will repulse them, and they will be compelled to act. And for how long they will act, that's up to the individual. But there's always going to be people, I have to believe, that will do the right thing. Not everybody, but enough people that ultimately justice occurs. And, and it may take a long time, but I have to believe that there are people like us who will continue to do this, who will not sell out. And those are the people whose side I'm on. And that's why I commend AE 911 and these other truth group groups. It's like they're the ones on the front lines, doing the hard work. And then you and I, we're trying to spread the message as well. So there's always going to be people who who have to do it because there's just no option otherwise. But there will be people that sell out too. And I can't, I can't be bothered with them. That's right. And you feel more powerful too when you put the powerful people on the spot if you can get into that position because they're yes. really, they're having to defend a lie and they're on feet yes. of clay. Uh, as a result of this. So they're actually weaker. So that kid out there who's being ridiculed because he watched some 9-11 truth video, let's say it's uh, the year is 2033 right now or something. Uh, you're being ridiculed because you brought up something about 9-11 conspiracy in school. Just stay the course. All of those people around you, they're just going to go along with whoever wins in the end anyway. All right. So if you stay true to your principles, you're going to be the guy leading that discussion in the future. Um, Okay, obviously you're still at this, you know, 2008. 
uh, you were talking about events that happened back then, and you were questioning 9-11 right from day one. So yep. am I. Um, but something, everybody who's still around now talking about this, there's something that keeps them going, something that gives them hope for the future. And I want to know, as we close out the show today, what is that for you? Some of the good things that happened out of 9-11 for me is I met, I made some friends. I met Dylan. I met Jason. I met Corey. I met Ramo Conscious, who I, I see semi-weekly. He's here in LA. He's one of my very best friends. I've made music with him. And I guess the thing that keeps me going is this ultimate belief. And I'm going to sound a little fuzzy wuzzy, but like, I have to believe in the human spirit and doing the right thing. And when you see your family, you see the friends that you've made, you see the conversations like the one I'm getting to have with you right now and the kinship that I feel with you and Jeff. That's what, that's what keeps me going, knowing that I'm not alone and knowing that there is a mission here. There is we are taking active part in trying to continue this thing that we feel strongly about, which for me is, I, I, I've criticized America a lot, but I love America. I love what has happened here. And the older I get, the more that I love it for, even for the, the issues and the things that we have misstepped upon, we still have the opportunity to lead the world. And right now we're not, and that's a problem. It's not just a problem for us. It is a problem for the world. And we have to accept our obligation to once again lead the world, do the right thing. When we're not doing the right thing, we need to speak up about it. Because if we don't, who's going to do it? China's not going to do it. Russia's not going to do it. Everybody's got their own agenda. But for the longest time, we were kind of the super Superman, right? And we've certainly faltered in the 21st century. But as an individual, my belief is that I must do this for the love of my family, for my friends, and just, just for doing what's right. Thank you so much for being a voice of truth out there. Tell everybody how to find your show. You guys, it's Michael Parker Media. It's that simple. And I am also on pretty much every platform, Michael Parker LA. I live in Los Angeles, so it's Michael Parker LA. But please subscribe to me. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's funny. I feel like I'm a heavily... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Shadow band guy. And then the other night I tried to get on your show and, and the rig that I've used for thousands of episodes, I can't speak. So, but I appreciate everyone's thoughts. I would love for them to listen to my show, Michael Parker media. Tell me what you want to hear. I try to talk about things that inspire a sense of awe and universe about the universe. Um, because I think the more questions that we ask, the more open-minded we become. So Michael Parker, LA on social media, Michael Parker media for the podcast. Thank you, Andy. I really appreciate this time today. No problem. And uh, folks, uh, pause that if you didn't get it and turn it back and get those so, those uh, websites and social media names written down. Check it out. But Michael, thank you so much for coming on 9-11 Freefall today. Thank you. Thank you.